thrilled to see you all. So, so <laughs> colleagues, we will make a start and it will be efficient for you, noting we've got multiple time zones. So I will commence with acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. And I'm so thrilled in this week before Christmas that these brilliant people are sharing this remarkable milestone event together as a family. We have so many time zones on the call. I need to log Dr. Leanne McRae, who will introduce the second in an early morning in Western Australia, right through to the legendary Liam, who's joining us from the, hello, the legendary Northwest at 1.30 a.m. in the morning. So we're going fully antipodal time. So colleagues, on behalf of Flinders University, thank you so much for being a part of this event with the legendary Alyssa and Amanda, who will meet very closely and personally shortly. But on behalf of the university, I really must thank Gail and Leanne for their incredible commitment to this university. Gail is, you know, associate head of school, so she's incredibly busy, has astonishing expertise in, in teaching and learning from the University of the Sunshine Coast, uh, is just a remarkable colleague and so generous with her time. And Gail, we thank you so much. And Leanne has these multiple experiences, including popular cultural studies, but I noticed that her current role is particularly focused on ethics and ethics support, which again is incredibly useful for the conversations we're going to have today. So colleagues, we're going to go for efficiency. We're going to have the wonderful Alyssa do a short presentation and then take questions, particularly from Gail and Leanne, but going forward, other colleagues are very, we'd love you to have your questions as well. Please put them in the chat that I'll be monitoring. And then we'll be moving to Amanda. Take a breath, Amanda, you're looking magnificent. Then we'll be moving to Amanda for her milestone event. And the final commentary I'll offer is, this is a weird sort of combined milestone, which is the wonderful Alyssa at the end of her journey. So it's her final milestone in her final three months, noting that Gail and Leanne were present for all her three milestones, which is a, an amazing, amazing moment, an amazing commitment. But the wonderful Amanda is doing her milestone right at the start as a confirmation of candidature. So how fantastic is this? So colleagues, are we ready to kick on? Oh, I'm getting, I got that from Gail, that's terrific. I'm getting nods from everybody else. Leanne, I'm not gonna miss this time when everyone's on mute and just people are nodding. It's become like a silent movie, hasn't it? Thanks for that, Leanne. It's become like a silent movie. So look, I'm now going to hand over to one of my arch nemeses uh, in life. Um, she is, I believe, my, my Skywalker apprentice, as she sometimes describes herself on Facebook. It is time for the legendary Alyssa Armstrong to present her final milestone. We were different people, I think, Alyssa, when we started this journey, but Alyssa, I'm so terribly proud of you. You are really the, the light and the force of popular cultural studies in dark times. So Alyssa, my queen, the floor is yours. Oh, it's so worrying. Um, okay, so this is my final thesis review. Um, my thesis is currently kind of entitled Dungeons, Dragons and Chainmail Bikinis. Um, and that title's kind of remained consistent since the beginning. Um, with the subtitle Fan Experiences with and Around D&D. My name is Elisa Armstrong. Elisa's my stage name. I haven't shared my screen yet, have I? No, you haven't. Yeah. I'm Let's excited though. Because I can see it. Uh, you want <clears throat> that one? Can you see my slides or my notes? Yes. No, I can see the slides. Okay, cool. So, that, that's my title slide. Okay. So I wanted to touch really quickly as we started about the relevance of my thesis because it's something I've had to kind of continually justify. Um, but actually I think that my thesis is more relevant now than it was when I started, which is cool. So it's very hard, I think, to keep track of D&D players. Wizards of the Coast, which is the publisher of Dungeons and Dragons currently, they do regular online surveys for their community, they publish them mainly through the website. I don't know if I've seen them on any of their social media, um, but they don't share any of that data really with the community. They just produce these big infographics and generally you see them through press releases where you get like a bunch of nerd sites like Kotaku giving you the, the summary. And a lot of the 
infographic is actually filled up with like what they're planning to release in the next year. So it's as much marketing, if not more marketing than it is kind of demographics. Um, yeah, so they also make it very hard to compare because they change the way they describe things. For example, between the 2019 and the 2020, you can see that um, in 2019, they said they had over 40 million fans. Um, and then in 2020, they say 50 million players. So there's a difference between fans and players. Um, I don't know what distinction they're drawing or if they're even really drawing a distinction, but it kind of... Um, it is, however, possible that it is 50 million fans um, because they have claimed a 33% year-on-year growth. d d has continued to grow for the last seven years. And so from 40 million to 50 million, that is kind of cohesive with that 33% increase. Um, they haven't released the data yet for 2021. If I follow the pattern, that's probably going to be out in March. Um, but if they achieve a similar growth, as to be expected, um, then we'd be in the realm of 65 to 70 million players, fans, or whatever they are counting. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was even bigger growth than that. Um, D&D has continued to seep into popular culture this year. They've done a lot of crossover products, a lot of stuff with Magic the Gathering. Um, and they really seem to have thrived during COVID with a lot of people starting to play D&D at home through these online platforms. Wizards of the Coast have produced a lot of free materials to encourage that kind of stay at home, play at home program. Um, and in 2020, just as a little side statistic, Wizards of the Coast claim there are over 1 billion views on TikTok's hashtag DD. So there is a social media buzz around it. Um, I wanted to talk about age and how age, age has changed, but for some reason, they changed the brackets they used between 2019 and 2020. Um, they completely deleted people under like 13, I think, and they broadened some of their later age brackets. Don't know why. Um, but we can see that the percentage of women players, according to this Wizards of the Coast research, has increased from 39 to 40%. Don't know where they got their research from again, so it's really hard to talk the validity of this and if there's any kind of the way they collected it, whether that introduces any kind of biases. Um, but it does show, uh, importantly, I think, that Wizards of the Coast themselves have noticed um, an increase in women playing D&D. So that makes it interesting in itself. The demographic data that I did, in, that I achieved in my survey, is a little bit shaky. It shakes Wizards of the Coast a little bit. Um, I think this might be due to different collection methods and channels, um, because if they're primarily using the website, I think they'll get them a specific kind of player um because i had 7.6 percent of my respondents identify as non-binary and then an additional 0.9 percent saying they'd rather not say their gender and 1.7 percent choosing to offer up a different identity that didn't fit the categories that were provided wizards of the coast had less than one percent non-binary which is far lower than my findings um, so that kind of shakes it a little bit for me. They're potentially not reaching a diverse audience in their own research, which means that they might be missing women as well. So the, the number of men compared to women might also be kind of shaky if they're missing some of the gender diversity in different communities. Um, especially because in my surveys responses, there was a really strong theme around d ds popularity with the queer community. And there is some overlap there with between the queer community and, and those gender diversity. So if Wizards of the Coast is missing some of those communities, I think it might be skewing their perception of who their target audience really is. Okay, so basically D&D is even more popular than when I started this thesis. It continues to gain traction in popular culture. And if we think about it, 40% using Wizards of the Coast statistics of 50 million fans are facing exclusion or sexual harassment and feeling unwelcome in the D&D community, that's a lot of people. So women's experiences with D&D are not those of a small minority. Uh, women are not a niche community that need to be catered to. Women are almost half of D&D players. Women's experiences are D&D players' experiences and the two can't be separated. <sighs> okay, so status report. Um, so 
as anyone who's seen the documents will have seen, um, I do have the structure of my thesis kind of created. Um, it doesn't have any consistency in formatting, but all the titles and kind of chapters have been skeletoned out. I have completed my data analysis, which took a lot of this year, um, because obviously I had over 49,000 responses. I asked a lot of open-ended <laughs> open questions, um, and some of those ended up being really long. People were quite generous in their responses, and it wasn't just, I kind of expected maybe a sentence, maybe two sentences, and some people gave me full paragraphs outlining their experiences for multiple questions. So I ended up having to read through something like half a million individual responses because it was important to me that I read every single response. Um, so I've taken some of those key results, I've taken some quotes that I feel are representative or indicative of the themes, um, and I have embedded them throughout my thesis. So I shouldn't have any need to go back to my, my spreadsheets or my data analysis. I did notice that I left out any demographic data in my draft um, when I went to pull it for this, this presentation. So I need to go back and add that in. I have done it. It's just not in there for some reason. Um, and I do need to elaborate on and describe some of those results that I found because at the moment they are just in there without anything really being done with them. I would say that my theoretical research is about 90% done. I don't know, it's really hard to quantify. I, I do think there are a few areas that could be stronger. Um, there are some arguments between me and my supervisor um, about how much research I should be doing. But I, I do plan to continue to monitor new research because there is always new research coming out about d, &D at the moment. And I think it's really important to stay on top of kind of where contemporary research is. So this is my thesis skeleton as it stands. Um, so obviously I've got an introduction, in case you got to I've got a chapter on methodology. I've got a chapter that's rolling a history check on D&D, &D, and that's really focused around not retelling D&D's history, but looking at how fans understand D&D's history. Um, and then we've got nostalgia, because that's a really strong driver as to why people play d and I've got a chapter on fans and fandom, um, just kind of outlining what does the D&D fandom look like. Um, a really big important chapter to me is the boundaries and gatekeeping in fandom chapter where we start to introduce some of those ideas of exclusion and those themes of gender-based exclusion start to come in. I've then separated out the consequences of gatekeeping because the ramifications of these boundaries and gatekeeping behaviours are, are huge and they do impact how, the, how, how women and other potentially marginalised players approach the game. I've got a chapter called d and Fandom Doing Fan Things, because I suck at titles, um, and that's more about the typical fan behaviours and how they apply to D&D, stuff like fan fiction, fan art, um, a chapter on paratex and their influence, where I really look at stuff like Critical Role and how this wave of podcasts are shaping how people understand the game. Because a lot of, it seems to me, a lot of D&D researchers think that d d players come to d d because of these TV shows that feature it or, you know, they listen to Critical Role and then they play. I found that it was more nostalgia driven um, and friend and family and relationship driven, but that's in the thesis. Um, and then I've got a chapter on role playing and a chapter on role playing and gender, um, where I kind of talk more about how, how players role play gender, what they bring to the table when they you know, if if I choose to role play a male barbarian orc, what am I bringing to make that performance of, of masculinity and make my character convincing? Um, there's also a sizable chunk on rape and role playing because it seems to be a thing that a lot of women have experienced that coming up. So I didn't want to just describe the fact that it does come up, but maybe look into some of the reasons why it keeps being. Oh. shoved in people's faces when it's not a nice topic um, and for that I touched a little bit on Nordic law. Now yesterday <laughs> um, I was having my mo Monday morning meeting with Tara and Amanda was there as well because we were, were talking a little bit about this milestone and I was complaining about the bloated nature of my thesis because I just outlined what 10 chapters to you there is a lot 
And at the moment in the draft, it's it's ridiculously large. And I'm finding myself in a position where I need to cut down, but I haven't even done some of the sections properly yet. And I don't know how to do the stuff justice whilst cutting back because there's not enough depth and it's just a thing. So Amanda said, why don't you split in two? I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I thought about different ways of splitting it and uh, had a little bit of a meditation. And I came up with maybe four different flavors for my thesis. I was like, maybe I could choose one of these flavors of thesis and that could be what I present. And then I have a more cohesive, coherent thread throughout the thesis. And I take the other content, which whilst valid and interesting, maybe doesn't add as much to the other bits. And then I'll just do something else with those. So, <laughs> oh, Tara hates me. Um, so I kind of came up with four, four flavors, one of which is, this is D&D. It's very descriptive. It's more, okay. yeah, it's, it's very descriptive. It's not as critical. I mean, there are some elements in there, but we really focus on how people understand the history and this nostalgia. You know, what is D&D's fandom? What are the paratexts? Not my favorite. Um, fans inclusion and exclusion. That's where we kind of focus in on those big chapters. With nostalgia, we probably just focus on how nostalgia might contribute to marginalization um, because in that there is a romanticization of the old days of D&D when women aren't, weren't as, um, a, as welcome to play and how nostalgia kind of smooths out history, removes the rough edges and kind of marginalizes those naysaying voices. Um, fans and fandom, obviously, boundaries and gatekeeping and then the consequences thereof. Possibly my favorite, might be why it's pink. Um, I came up with perceptions of the game, which is looking at how D&D players look at the game so it's how D&D players see history, how nostalgia shapes how they see D&D, how fans perceive themselves. Because I think it's really, it's interesting to see how we see fandom or how external people see fandom, but what fans believe is indicative or kind of makes fandom special. Um, that would pull from a couple of different chapters. That's not currently a chapter in itself. And then paratexts, refocusing on, we just have to refocus the chapter and remove some of the sections perhaps on paratext and play. I don't know. And then the last one is playing D&D and that's looking at the playing activities of D&D. So that's how nostalgia drives people to play and how it shapes their play in the sense that there's a lot of people who play something called the old school renaissance, which is they take modules from 2.5 and they try to make it workable not with fifth edition, but as a rule set that's cohesive so people can play old D&D. &D. Um, what playing in public is like, how people might feel uncomfortable or unwelcome when playing, which was a really big topic for um, women's responses. Um, with the fan things, looking at how people enjoy D&D &D in ways other than playing. So fan fiction, drawing characters, creating characters, um, there's a lot of kind of peripheral activities to d d that seem to really enhance people's enjoyment of the game. Um, paratexts, again, drive to play and how they influence play. Um, critical role kind of shapes how a lot of people approach the game. Role playing, why is role playing attractive and why role play right? So yeah, that's something that I've got to consider going forward as maybe an option for how I reduce my thesis down whilst making it stronger. That's kind of something I'm really keen to get some feedback on potentially. Um, so finally, the final two months, because I really actually only have January and February, because um, I'm submitting on the 4th of March and there's only like three days left of this month. Um, so the last actions I want to take in 2021, I want to draft using a paper copy I've been told it changes the way you see a thesis and I think it might be worth a crack. Um, those first 10 days of 2022, um, I want to write up as much of possible as what's missing, hopefully all of it, especially if we narrow down the chapters because that'll make it way easier. And then on the week beginning the 10th of January, we start the 10 draft process that I am being encouraged, nay forced to do by my supervisor. Um, she's a cow. <laughs> 
Um, so that's kind of a drafting process where we focus on something different each time, slowly refining and, and bringing it together. I said by draft five, no new content. Um, I have been told that that's too late and I might have to make that, you know, draft two or one, no more content. And then we submit on 4th of March. Success. Thank you. Thank you, my queen. That's fantastic. I'm loving the flavours too. That's a whole thing I didn't know we were going to talk about today. Look, I'll Surprise. kick straight. Yeah, it's good. And with the bananas all happening as well, the level of excitement is just fantastic. So, look, to Leanne and Gail, I'll, I'll start with you both. Leanne, do you want to kick off uh, questions first? And so what we'll do, colleagues, is get the questions from the assessors and then questions from colleagues more widely. So, Leanne, do you want to kick us off, mate? Sound, you dad. Oh, sound. I gotcha. No, I gotcha. Sound. Gotcha. Oh, how are we going? Is that all right? Gotcha. We got sound? Okay, good. Gotcha. Um, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you for your presentation and congratulations on getting to this milestone. It's a huge achievement. So um, first thing is, yes, there's a lot <laughs> and I wouldn't be afraid of it. That's the important thing. Don't be afraid of size. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, there's some, I think it's a really rich space that you're working in. And I think don't be afraid of that because at the moment it seems really unruly and out of control. Um, but that's okay. It's a thesis, <laughs> it's a PhD. That's what happens. It's supposed to get out of control. So don't be frightened of it. Let it be what it is. And rather than trying to get yourself into a state of already thinking about what you want to cut out, don't do that. You've got 10 drafts to cut things out. Don't let it be as large and as unruly as it needs to be right now, because that's so important for in this thesis and when I was reading um, your notes I didn't I didn't read your 360 pages I'm, I'm very apologetic about that um, <laughs> but when I was what I did read I felt a really strong sense of storytelling particularly in the way that you write particularly in the way that you're con your participants the people who answered your survey and I wanted to know, had you thought about the role of storytelling in your thesis? I don't want to add to mm. what is already mm. large, but I want to, because I think there's such a strong L prose, but within how you're approaching the material and aggregating those results, because I think mm. it's so important, you know, the, the narrative that you're presenting about allowing the responses to dictate where you take it, the responses into what you want them to be or, or your argument. I think that's incredibly valuable and important. But I wanted you to maybe think about or talk to me about the role of storytelling and how you feel about storytelling and in particular how that relates to women's voices and storytelling in your thesis. I guess, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying I can keep it a little bit unruly. Um, yeah, no, I, I know that I, I'm kind of presenting a lot of people's stories and I guess within that I'm telling a story, but I've felt this kind of tug between being narrative and being critical and making sure that I'm always pulling it back around to a point. And it's weird telling a story with an agenda and then I don't know where to put my stories in it because some of the things I'm talking about I've experienced. But then I'm like, well, should I be saying these things or should I just be using participants? What do I do? It's hard. Well, I tell you, I saw Gail jump it's straight it's in there as our expert of storytelling and narrativization of disempowered experiences. Gail, you're up. Oh, look, Leanne, what a gift of a comment because I, I spent the whole time thinking, okay, so what mechanism might Alyssa use to shape what she has? And then you came in and said, no, don't shape it, enjoy it, 
allow it to roam, allow it to be. And I started to agree with that. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm shaping too early or thinking of a mechanism by which to shape too early. But then as soon as you, and, and, and so I'll just tell you what I was thinking before you gave me my new thought, Leanne. So what I was thinking initially, Lisa, was my gosh, there is a lot here and there's a lot of really rich stuff. Now, not everything will fi find its way into their thesis, but that doesn't mean that that won't find its way into the world. So what you cut from your thesis, you keep for your papers, you keep for your podcast, you keep for all the other ways in which you're going to disseminate your information. So a cull is not, you know, it's not getting rid of stuff. It's repurposing stuff. So that's just on the off side. Then... Um, and I was thinking, actually, would your theoretical framework, you talked briefly about adopting a feminist theoretical kind of framework. You didn't specify what that was or what the particular theorists or what the particular feminist feminism or feminisms that you're using might be. I was thinking, would that be the mechanism through which you would just decide which what you would keep? in your in your um, chapters and what you might not or might what, what find a a place elsewhere. However, I really love what Dr. McRae had said. I love it so much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add to it if you like for a moment and start thinking about what you might do there. So um, your focus has always been on on play. You know, <laughs> the, the focus is on who's playing, how are they playing in that space. How are, rep how are people represented in that play? Who is not? All of that stuff. So it's all been about play. It's all been, and the, the, Leanne's absolutely right. Your thesis that you've written so far has been very much, this is my journey. This is my story, my journey through this research project. So actually you're already in it. And you've, you've stated that in your thesis or, or in your document that you've created so far, you've been very, very clear. You said no one is outside of their research. You know, there's, there's sections in your, in your writing where you've already, you've already identified that you're already in it. You might therefore, and I don't think it would take a huge amount of work, start to think about your autoethnographic relationship with the document. And there are beautiful and really quick and easy ways to do this in that you have a quick section at the beginning where you say, when the text is blue, it's me speaking or when the font changes or whatever it is, this is my, um, you know, my story in relation to the story of the data. So there are different ways in which you might do that. Um, it's saying up front though, that you're narrativizing the document, that you're actually creating a, a narrative, your, your role within the play, observing the play, observing the data, etc. Um, so there's some kind of nice and easy kind of ways in which you can do that. But I think that you, the fact that you've already acknowledged that you're in it means that you, you, you can't now step outside of it and pretend that it's some sort of objective the body of work that you've had no you've had no kind of say and you've got you haven't got your hands dirty and you have you know you you, you conceptualized it because you're invested in it because you're interested in it um you you frame the questions around that which you have a curiosity in and which you have an interest in uh you've ana you've analyzed it according to your own understanding and your own frameworks and ideas and, and passions and interests so you're already right in the middle of it making that explicit and writing that as a narrative I think will help you frame and decide what stays in and what stays out okay. so I think that Leanne's point was actually genius I think these two are the greatest successes I think we've ever seen in the universe you two I think that's powerful and also Gail the way that Alyssa handles time and nostalgia is very powerful for me in this thesis. Using the Lowenthal, you know, the past is a foreign country, quoting who we know, the Hartley, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And I think Alyssa works brilliantly with her own past when she did things differently there. And that might enable storytelling through understandings of time and gatekeeping just remarkable look I'll give Leanne and Gail one, one more batter up and then we'll, we'll open up to colleagues my my life has changed in the last five minutes Leanne in, next comment or question my darling wow yeah. well oh. this um follows on kind of wanted maybe 
also something that Gail can help with a little bit is I was thinking about, and maybe Alyssa, Alyssa can think about, what does it mean to be a data custodian? Mm -hmm. And a lot of this work is being done particularly around Indigenous research, so feminist kind of trajectory around that. But for there's a book that I've been reading for a while now called Decolonising Solidarity, and it's about how researchers... Uh, you know, behave as data custodians for material knowledge that's not theirs, that is from a disempowered community, is entering into an empowered framework. And it should be, should be. And I think that's a really important narrative. And uh, like I said, maybe Gail can help with the feminist trajectory of that, whereas I'm more in the post-colonial kind of trajectory of that a little bit more. And the other thing I wanted to t mention is relationship between physicism and again I don't want to add more <laughs> to what this is already doing but to me fandoms about own, you know this ownership sorry <laughs> this ownership over the text and whereas before the fans or well, I'm saying before you know back in the back in the day uh, ownership of the fans over the text with the writers or the producers so maybe there's a struggle of ownership between the players of this text and whose ownership is, is, is uh, you know, and, you know, that capitalism is about ownership and about who's allowed to own what and who gets to, to narrativize that ownership. And it also then connected me to, so I'm just jamming everything into this one final comment about the relationship of fantasy here. And it, when I was reading Elisa's work, I was thinking, is it not okay for women to have fantasy? That maybe fantasy is a is psychoanalyst, but this idea that the male fantasy in to a respect maybe you know, women's fantasy is, is a subaltern, maybe. Mm. I don't know. So I, and final comment before I leave, everybody should be watching Hawkeye at the moment because it's got an amazing construct of deafness and being hard of hearing in it. It's amazing. But also LARPers, the idea of they've got these live action role players that pe pepper through the text it's about costuming and these LARPers are first responders. So it's a construct of play. Losers who are trying to fantasise themselves into being something different. It's about, is a complexity of role playing that's being conveyed there. So don't want to add, like I said. No, but. Le Leanne, crucial, because as I hand over to Alyssa just give her 30 seconds to think that through for a moment. Obviously, this is a post Jenkins thesis. Leanne, this is a seriously post-Henry Jenkins thesis and it's a very staunch critique of, of Jenkins uh, and really his, his body of work. And she's got quant and qual to offer that critique. And what you've suggested there, I think, it gives her the courage to go into a post-capitalism framework and think about the ownership in a post-Jenkins framework. So Alyssa, my darling, over to you. Anything you'd like to offer there? Oh, hello. I heard Satan speak then. Um, Alyssa, darling, have you got a commentary? Uh, no, my mind is like, and I've got a lot to think about there, but it's it's really cool. I like the uh, the custodian, the, the data custodian thing. That's like super cool. <laughs> yeah, that solves your problems. Everything we've talked about for the last six months, that solves your problems and also handles the post Jenkins critique as well. So Leanne, crucial points about methodology and ontology there. Going, going to Gail for her last week and then we'll open up for any colleagues. But Gail, are there other areas that you particularly would like to focus on? No, not, no, again, I'd like to just pick up on that notion mm. of custodianship. Mm. Um, because you already talk about Alcoff, you already talk about kind of issues around whose responsibility and what, and the ethics around what you do with data. So in some ways, you've already got a lot of stuff in your writing there that I think will link to that. I think that making that really explicit, being really explicit about the responsibility that comes with, with having access to data, 
responsibilities around how to make it available to people. But also, I think there are some really sensitive and interesting things here around the kind of the genders that were represented in your in your um, data um, demographics, in your in your participant pool. Um, I would be thinking in terms of custodianship. How do you? And I, I don't want to make any assumptions, but how might a cisgendered person? How might somebody who identifies as woman? What are the custodian? type right, ethics and responsibilities around how one represents that information, that data. Um, it's obviously missing at the moment, and that's that's crucial in terms of the narrative spines of, of the Dungeon Dragon series. It's it's in terms of characterizations, in terms of a whole suite of different ways in which the makers and the producers of that series need to address uh, you know, the way that they de define their genders and, and represent their characterizations, etc. in light of this. So I just think that that's where I would link the custodianship with, with what you've got there as data. And also, Gail, isn't it politically interesting that we've got a cisgendered person uh, that has, through their qual-quant methodological work, discovered and revealed this non-binary identifying um, participant work that has never existed in the history of investigating Dungeons and Dragons in the past. And that custodian work and also how Alyssa has done that is stunningly important. And I would be looking at what were the triggers, what, what facilitated people to identify in that way? How was that structured in such a way that people felt confident and comfortable? to reveal that, you know, why, why this data now through this mechanism, through this survey, et cetera, and why have Dungeons and Dragons not collated that data themselves? What are the barriers to them receiving? I just think that there's some really interesting work to do there. Brilliant, Gail. Now, Alyssa Dowling, would, would you like to offer a commentary to Gail's remarkable work? I think she's given you your conclusion, certainly. Um, yeah, and I just want to say that I had quite a lot of, uh, trans uh, people who identified as trans and um, talked about transgender issues in their responses, mm. um, especially around role playing and gender. And like that could be its own chapter. There was so much there, but I have specifically chosen kind of not to do anything with it at this point, because I don't feel like I come from a place of understanding where I could really discuss all of the issues or I have nowhere to begin researching and it, it feels almost inappropriate. Um, you see, and that's your narrative that Leanne was talking about. That's you framing the data. That's you saying, this is why I presented it in this way and not this way and linking it to notions of responsibility, of custodianship, of all of those things that Leanne was talking about. I think that's, that's your framing, actually. I would be honest. Okay. I, would, I would tell us what you have just said. Okay. Thank you. Oh, magnificent. So look, for the final couple of minutes, we've got so many wonderful genius people on the call. Are there uh, questions you would like to ask? I'm very happy for people to, to unmute or do a question in the box. Who, who would like to speak to this? And look, I will probably ping Aidan quickly because Aidan has been with Alyssa through the journey, including the mid-candidature. So Aidan, is there any commentary you would like to offer at this juncture? Uh, I, I think that um, the, the story that you're telling around the way that this thesis looks and works now is really clear. Like the thing, the thing for me, and it was like the same with mine, is like, I didn't really know what I was doing when I had, like I had data and I was kind of like, hmm, that's good, but now what? And I think your clarity around how you're representing that, what's there and where this thing's going, the story that you're telling, I think that is really clear. Like I know you've got these flavors and I really liked that sort of portrayal as the flavors, but I think actually, you know what you're doing. You've got a really clear picture in your head. And I think, you know, it's gonna take some finessing and 10 drafts and yeah, that's a whole process, but actually, for me, having watched the, the, the whole thing unfold, you know, as, as with Leanne and Gail, I think, you know, it's been an incredible thing watching you think through this and see it grow. So I think, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's really cool. So, yeah. Oh, Aiden, you're a superstar. Uh, 
And has someone else got a question? I just heard someone demute. Anyone got a question? Oh, Be I was about to go to Beck. Beck, talk to me. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. That was really interesting. It was fantastic because I haven't actually seen a final a milestone yet. And so yours is the first one for me. So, Elisa, as the custodian of this data, when it goes out into the world, what do you want to change? Will you give it to Dungeons and Dragons? What, what, what is it that you want to change or reveal? I mean, I know what you want to reveal. Um, what do you hope to change or say to the world? Yeah, so um, outside of this. Oh, hi. It's Catherine Sharp here. I did a report for Catherine, Antonin. Catherine and Darling, emailed it with you. some other documents on you. Sunday. Catherine, um, Catherine Sweetheart. I haven't heard back from him, but I'm, I'm checking my outbox and it's saying the documents have not left the point. server or Catherine something Darling. like that. But Catherine, Catherine Darling. It went at Catherine, nine. Catherine Sweetheart, I've got it. Right, done, bless. That got a bit exciting for a moment, didn't it? So <laughs> look at Paul Liam's face. It's like I've I've uh, seen and heard things. Oh no, she's demuted. Hang on. Are we gonna hang on. Ask to get it. Catherine Dar she's demuted for me. So go for it, Beck. Please continue, darling. Then we'll go to Alyssa. I th I th yeah. Yeah. I um, so outside of the the thesis itself, I want to find a a couple of channels maybe to spread the data in a less academic kind of focused way so maybe more of infographics i don't know i've started watching tiktok maybe there's a tiktok thing i don't know academic tiktok apparently like i've learned some stuff um so i wouldn't ever give the data set to anyone like wizards of the coast i wouldn't want them anywhere near it because i don't think i don't think it would be appropriate i don't think that's what any of my participants would, would ever want. Um, I would I would love to collaborate with some people around the data, especially when we're talking about some of the, the issues that I don't have the first hand or even second hand experience of. For example, um, some of the, the transgender community stuff where maybe someone else could bring in some more of that perspective and we could we could work together because I would I am really nervous of leaving any data on the floor, as it were. I, I want everything to kind of get scooped out, pushed out. I don't want anyone to, you know, if they've done my survey and they stumble on the data, I don't want anyone to think, well, that's that doesn't represent anything of what I said. Like, or feel like they've kind of had their results cut out because it didn't suit some narrative. So yeah, got to think of a, a good way to do it, but I will definitely be trying to be responsible in, in sharing it because it was heavily requested in survey responses as well that I share it on Facebook and I it makes its way back through all the channels that the survey made it through. There's, there's lots of publications for you. Can I just go to Dr. McRae for a moment? Are we almost at the point, Leanne, where we could do an open access data set? I was Have thinking, I into, if, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Elise, is, you're going to have to cut you know there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to be you're not going to be able to put in there and that's fine i think you need to make peace with that a little bit and you know personally <laughs> but also there's no reason why you can't appendicize it that it, it can't be identified i mean i mean the we can talk about yeah. issues of how people consented to do your research and whether they consented to have it being used further research but there are ways or I guess around managing that in your in how you would set up your do your fascinating absolutely fascinating Beck magnificent question there about dissemination which is so typical and important in every thesis but incredibly important with the scale of data and data set so so look colleagues I'm very happy we'll hold questions for a moment and people have had a lot of thoughts about that we might return to this at the conclusion but I should now open without can we firstly just thank can we do Alyssa Alyssa you're a legend Alyssa you're a legend 
your, your religion. The shirt was magnificent. The hair was magnificent. The content is magnificent. We'll return to you shortly. But now, of course, we've got the Queen herself. So we've got Amanda, who is about to share her remarkable uh, thesis with us right at the start. So this is a confirmation of Kancha. So Amanda, darling, are you happy to do a bit of screen sharing? And uh, we'll kick on. Good luck, Amanda. Yes. Rock and roll, girlfriend. Okay, I'll just share. Gotcha. Got it? Got it, Dylan. Uh, is that on? Oh, oh, hang on. Present? Yeah, that's always the fun bit, isn't it? Oh, you're got right. I've, you I've both got no, don't look at don't look at them. <laughs> it's always exciting, isn't it, when you see other people's stuff and how they do their work. <laughs> I'm always a bit excited by that. You go, Amanda. Bottom of the front. That's very postmodern. Look, for Christmas, this is great. Let's do that. I'm gonna Good work, luck. I'm gonna work backwards. Like for Christmas. The, like the Japanese. <laughs> right to the left. Good on Sorry. you. Sorry. Oh. Well, thank you for attending today, everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Cooper, and I'd firstly like to thank my supervisory team, Tara, Shaney, and Aiden, um, and also for the reviewers and assessors. Thank you very much for your contributions. My research focuses on how did teachers understand interdisciplinary teaching and learning in the middle years in Japan. This is an outline of um, the presentation for today. Um, so I'll just work through these slides with you. This is an introduction of my experience having worked in Australia, Taiwan and Japan in Australian government schools and private schools, international schools in Taiwan and Japan. And my background and disciplinary method is the visual arts and design technology. Additionally, some work in sports education, um, various leadership roles and examination assessor roles as well. The background and context. So throughout my time in education, there's been several changes, obviously, with um, 25 plus years. And also my previous research in interdisciplinary teaching and learning um, in secondary school context has led me to this research. I did my master's research um, in this area and I really love it. I'm very passionate about this, this area of teaching and learning. Um, additionally, having worked in Japan for four years, which was a steep learning curve for me, and also I, I enjoyed it immensely, but I witnessed that there were many changes happening in Japan, one of which was the introduction of IB programs into the Article 1 schools, the Article 1 schools are the Japanese government schools. They're fully fu funded by the Japanese government. Um, these changes were brought about by the Kaidanrin, which was the Japanese Business Federation, wanting to improve and revitalise Japan. Um, for anyone who's lived in Japan, it's, it's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful society. Things do move slowly and it's very relational. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. The IB is a provider of curriculum frameworks and they support schools throughout the world. They're also uh, providing curriculum frameworks in a number of different school, number of different countries around the world. For example, Canada, um, Ecuador, Germany, Malaysia, um, and also Korea and Taiwan mm. are investigating the changes in their national curriculums and looking to the IB for support in that area. Um, statement of purpose. So the research questions, how do teachers understand inter interdisciplinary teaching and learning in the middle years in Japan? 
Um, having worked in international baccalaureate schools, dealing with middle years program frameworks and also the diploma program framework, working with a number of different people, so diverse thinking, people from different cultures around the world, people don't all see what you see. They don't have that Western lens. So there's the Eastern lens as well that needs to be considered. Um, so how do teachers view these um, interdisciplinary teaching and learning in a Japanese international school as opposed to an Article 1 school? What are the enablers and what are the, the barriers to this learning? Um, what does the enacted curriculum look like? Um, and what are some of the different subject combinations? So there's, there's many different uh, questions, I suppose, that I think of considering this investigation and research. The literature review, I looked at uh, several re researchers and what I was coming up with was that mainly most of the researchers were from Western origin. So I specifically started searching for Eastern um, researchers, particularly people in Japan. Um, it took a while to find them. There, there is more and more um, coming about, but I have listed some of the researchers there, the Japanese re researchers. So that's quite interesting to me to get that um, more East, Eastern perspective. I wanted to make sure that, that that had a voice and that was included as well. Um, the research methods, um, understanding interdisciplinary teaching and learning um, by looking at the cu curriculum documentation um, designed and written by the International Baccalaureate Organization. Um, examples of interdisciplinary units and unit plans that are written by teachers, teachers that would be using international baccalaureate documentation. Um, they might be international school teachers or Article 1 teachers working in Japanese um, funded government schools. So looking at how does the Eastern viewpoint understand um, the Western curriculum. So this ethnographic, um, autoethnographic approach will be throughout the research. The significance of the research and the contribution to knowledge will inform other um, areas, organisations. So just to, for the potential clash of curriculum culture, um, exploring the relationship between different cultural understandings, informing teaching practice in IB schools, Article 1 schools. It also provides scope for further investigation in relation to Taiwan and South Korea. But definitely, I think the significance for me as it's, it's unfolded is that Eastern perspective um, viewpoints, I think not maybe being as heard as much as they could be with a Western curriculum. Um, methodology and research framework. So I will draw on my lived experiences from my four years in Japan. Um, researchers listed here are a, a starting point and I'm particularly interested in Hughes and Pennington. Um, very interested in that privilege and penalty. Mm. Um, I think is quite important given the, the sort of the society, the culture in, in Japan. And I've also uh, recently, um, thank you to my supervisor, um, looking at standpoint theory and how we view matters, and that may depend on our social platform, which I think is actually quite important in the cultural context of Japan. Um, and I see that sort of fitting in with um, Hughes and Pennington's privilege and penalty quite, quite well. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
I skipped a slide, sorry. Um, so the research frame, framework here currently, um, these aspects will address uh, various directions that um, I will take, one being lived experiences of my own in Japan and also consideration of um, teachers' perspectives living in Japan and the, the variety that I will come across mm. given Japanese teachers working in a Japanese school, Western teachers working in an international school or Japanese teachers working in an international school. So there's quite a few different differences that um, I will need to, to consider. Also teachers being trained in a Western university or having been trained in a Japanese university. And there's quite a few variations with that as well um, that have actually come, come to light. Um, data collection methods. Um, so data will be collected and analyzed and synthesized. That will be the IB documents, um, surveys, interviews, so table one on page 25 of the document is an overview of the ethnographic models that I've investigated. Page 35 is the study structure for collection of data. Page 32 has the um, collection of um, the log for labeling um, as a sample for that. And there's also at the end of the proposal, a list of questions as a way to gather data. Those questions are written in English, but they will need to be written in um, Japanese for Japanese speakers so that they gain the correct understanding of um, what, what, what they're being asked. Um, so the data will be collected through the surveys uh, via Qualtrics is listed in the ethics approval and participant interviews via Zoom, uh, which will be labelled and organised and also analysed for interpretation. The research <laughs> participants um, will come from the Middle Years Program East Asian Network um, which is a, a governing body in Japan for IB schools where the um, middle years program coordinators get together. Um, heads of school, principals, um, assistant principals, teaching staff in international schools and Article 1 schools. Um, data is collected, it will be transcribed and analysed um, via the documents and the surveys and the interviews with participants. And the importance and the relevance of this study uh, will inform next international schools, Article 1 schools, of some of the enablers and barriers to interdisciplinary teaching and learning in MYP programs, hopefully in, to create change. Uh, informing heads of school, admin teams, um, teachers to improve understanding. Um, it can lead to research in other countries as well. For example, South Korea and Taiwan and informing the academic community. Yeah. Adding to um, other research as well. So progress to date, which is listed there. Um, and one thing I actually omitted to put in there that I have written an article, uh, submitted an article to the Educational Studies Japan, ESJ. They had a special issue for um, educational dialogue between East and West in the global era, era. So I just sort of stumbled across that. So I sent an article which linked really well to my my question of how do teachers understand interdisciplinary teaching and learning. 
So I tagged it with my question and then added early findings and literature review. So I won't I won't find out about that until December 2022. So that's um that's a way off um, yet. And my research plan, which is listed here, um, in relation to those dates, they might. Uh, be a little bit of movement in some of those because of the um, uh, the northern hemisphere pressure points for teaching staff for example um, assessment points of IB exams um, assessment and reporting to, to parents uh, which I'm aware of because I worked in the northern hemisphere so I'm just mindful of that I don't want to create any more stress on the staff in schools and credibility and originality. So the, with the trend toward interdiscipline, to interdisciplinary teaching and learning, um, as more schools are implementing MYP, it'll provide us with um, understandings in cultural context, because it, it can change, in particular with Eastern views and Western viewpoints, Eastern views, implementing and using a Western thinking curriculum. Um, so yes, that's, ve that's very interesting to me. And I want to make sure that the voices are heard of particularly the, the Japanese teachers, um, some of whom I've worked with several Japanese teachers. So I wanna make sure that their, their thinking um, is heard. Limitations and delimitations. So obviously the geographical location with me living in Australia um, and the, the participants will be in Japan and due to COVID, obviously travel will be unlikely. Um, so therefore the collection of data will be electronic, the survey, the interviews through Zoom, but at least that provides with a, a consistent method of collecting the data. Uh, consent and access. So ethics has already been approved through Flinders University. Um, the security uh, to safeguard information that will all be held on the Flinders University drive to ensure the confidentiality um, for the participants. And in conclusion, um, how do teachers understand interdisciplinary teaching and learning in the middle years in Japan? Currently, there isn't any research that I have found in this area. So um, the autoethnographic, ethnographic methodology will support this research. And it makes me think in conclusion, so what happens if we only have one lens? Are we supposed to view the world through a Western lens? I don't think we're meant to. So I think we need to consider both lenses. And I'm very passionate about interdisciplinary teaching and learning for students. I really believe it can impact the world through education which is a key to change and I think it's quite cr crucial that we have diversity of views in the research and that's it that's you Amanda aren't you going to do your last fabulous slide oh I've I think I've lost my I don't know what I did to the presentation sorry I've got it well, we, that's that's exciting, um, Amanda. You are legendary. I was I was just obsessed by your last slide. That's all. But I am so thrilled, Amanda. Well done, Amanda. Incredibly well done, my darling. Brilliant girl. Ah, there we go. See, I was excited by that. Thank you. I did get some summers. <laughs> I was excited by that. Um, right. So I'm thrilled with this thesis oh. in thousands of ways, Amanda. So I'm now going to open this up to our assessors first. I'll stop and, sharing. Is that all right? You can never stop sharing. It's a sharing <laughs> time. 
Um, I'm going to move firstly to the legendary Gail because we started with Leanne last time. And I, Leanne and I are going to have some moments, I reckon, during this one. We're going to have some moments. Um, but Gail, let's let's go to you with this provocative and powerful and highly original thesis. Yeah, I thought it was very sophisticated to be a, a first master um, presentation. Yeah, I think that your thinking is, is already very sophisticated and you've already got a really a, a solid understanding of a lot of the literature and some of the ideas that you're going to be bringing forward through your research. So I wanted to congratulate you on that. I think it's very impressive at this stage. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in a couple of things that are allied to what you're saying here. So what I have to say now may not feel or be relevant. So that's fine. They may just sit up against, they may not be a part of your journey going forward. Does that make sense? Yep. But I think I might share them anyway. I'm really interested in something called epistemic justice. Oh. And the idea is, you know, I, I won't do a disservice to try to define it, but I'll just give some sort of concepts around it, if I may. So the idea is that um, in a lot of our education systems, especially Eurocentric education systems, um, there is a privileging and a favouring of a particular type of epistemological lens or lenses. So what happens then, a number of things happen. One is that other lenses, other epistemological frameworks and lenses are deprivileged. Mm. The other is that we all lose out because we don't have the benefit of that really diverse set of lenses through which our curricula is based and developed. Um, other things align with this as well, and that is around discipline and disciplinary privilege. So certain disciplines are privileged over others in most secondary education, I would argue in all levels of education, but you're looking- I would I totally agree with that. <laughs> so interestingly, when you're talking about lenses, whether that's Eastern and Western, I actually see this as part of a broader framework of epistemological justice of plurality um, and therefore, and you've, you've alluded to this already, Amanda, in your beautiful writing that you've done already. You've started to talk about the really wicked and complex problems that the world is facing at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we're ever going to be able to address those in any way, shape or form is through interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. That we cannot in silos engage with these interrelated complex and wicked kind of problems. And you're talking about climate, et cetera. There are, there are many and they're all interrelated. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would be certainly pursuing that, but I'd be probably looking at this in just a slightly broader framework of that epist epistemic justice. And that this, what, what you're doing that is part of a broader kind of decolonizing or uh, broadening and um, trying to make multiple the lenses and the disciplines through which we engage in knowledge and learning and you know pedagogy and everything associated with that so I thought it was really exciting um, I thought it was I thought it was really really as I said mature for this stage I'd probably just think about maybe even a, a broader framework as just to reflect where you where your lens sits within that kind of broader framework mm. because there's already this lovely stuff that Leanne would be able to kind of talk about it kind of decolonizing the curriculum uh, you know it sits alongside that I think as an armory or as part of the armory that is around epistemic justice and and the way that we can re-privilege disciplines through interdisciplinarity, we can also um, create more multiple ways of knowing uh, mm. through interdisciplinarity and through epistemic justice as well. So, yeah. so Gail's magnificent point there works brilliantly with Liam's comment, Liam, you're a legend. And of course, Amanda, that works powerfully with standpoint theory too. So Amanda, do you mm. want to respond to that in some form? To Gail's commentary. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. actually really um, glad that you mentioned re-privileged disciplines because coming from a visual arts um, background, you're always pushed aside. So um, it's, it's, they often talk about STEM 
Um, no one's really interested in STEAM, but I always insist if someone's going to use that terminology, it has to be STEAM and that interdisciplinarity is not just maths and science. It is what, what disciplines you need to use to solve a problem or, or move forward or create something new. So um, can, I, can I say something a little bit provocative here? I'm not sure anybody's going to agree with me. I kind of get a little bit upset when the, the, the arts are used as a vehicle to support STEM. Mm. So I think that there's some problematics around that as well. The, the, the movement from STEM to see, oh, it's all right, we'll include it. We'll use it. We'll use it so that our agenda, which is based on STEM, has has more engine if you like has more power mm. you know the arts and the humanities and all of the, and the social sciences they have value outside of their ability to propel a stem uh, agenda mm. that's just an, as an does example. anyone want to just randomly do this in response to gail and make her prime minister of the world <laughs> um, yeah so so can i can i say gail what you've done with amanda's work there is you provoked Amanda to to reveal some of the very complex onion levels of this great woman to to actually say what she really thinks and I think Amanda Gail's commentary there will give you courage I think mm. to to really say what you need to say and I know you want to say <laughs> I want to say one other thing really really quickly yes and that is when you start to talk, talk about privileging and deprivileging you talked about um the arts in particular or a particular form of art in particular, you cannot look at that deep privilege without looking at Cartesian divide, without looking at gender, without yeah. looking at the way that certain ways of knowing, because this is all about epistemology, everything you're talking about in terms of mm. disciplines is ways of knowing, ways of processing information, mm. what is valued, what is not. You can't do that without looking at the Cartesian divide and this notion that to know, to be cognitive, to be rational, to be analytic, is somehow privileged, is somehow to be, and therefore to feel, to be soulful, to be intuitive, to be artful in other ways, mm -hmm. is somehow lesser in the way that that was used and has been propagated as a gendered kind of attack um, against women and women's leadership and women's overall kind of contribution. So I think that what you're talking about when you start talking about privileging and deprivileging disciplines, as well as, um, Eastern or Western ways of thinking. You know, if you talk about interdisciplinarity, you're talking about all of those things, reprivileging and and being bent, having all of those elements of discipline and ways of knowing to be at the service of the knower and to mm. be engaged in and uh, try to address these wicked problems of the 21st mm. century. Yeah. Amanda, did you see why I particularly wanted Gail to be involved in your confirmation of candidature? Yes. <laughs> How good is Gail? Does anyone else want to be Gail? I just, <laughs> Stop it, I just no, want to be Gail. So, <laughs> so, it's good. so Amanda, do you want to offer a quick response before Leanne McRae and I get a bit yes. down and dirty yeah. in the mud? Um, yes, well, thank you for those comments. That's fantastic. And I, I will I will look at... It's, no, it's really exciting to get some other, you know, ideas. I love it. And I, I do think the ways of knowing... Um, can be referenced in so many different ways, can't they? Like the, from so many different points, so many different frames of re reference that I think even living in Taiwan and Japan, as I did for six years, taught me so much that there's always something new that you can learn, yeah. no, no matter what age you are. And look, the, the IB is a, is a very provocative lens to investigate those topics. And as I'm going to Leanne McRae, and I was watching your face throughout that. Now, now the word lens. Now, now Leanne and I have done a fair amount of work on post-coloniality, the East and the West, Leanne. Now, I wonder whether we are having a conversation now about lenses and standpoint theory, which is, I think, a way through, or whether should, we should be exploring a prism. Leanne, what would you like to ask the legendary Amanda? Hello, Amanda. Oh, hello, um, Thank you. So oh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was 
lovely um, and you're working in some really um, cutting edge terrain I think it's a really important project so congratulations on that <laughs> what I wanted to ask you was you're doing interdisciplinarity which is so important and you're right you need these diverse ways of thinking to break rules to do things differently and to solve complex problems in it as well but yeah. my first question to you is that you've got this wonderful interdisciplinarity that you're working within but you're doing that through the lens a binarized lens of mm. east versus west mm. and i want you to maybe talk to me about why you've made that choice and what it offers your project i'm not saying you shouldn't do it or that you mm. can't do it but i interested in what the richness is in in doing that um so the reason for the eastern and western lens is actually having worked with japanese teachers they they do see things differently to what i would see now that doesn't mean to say that that that's wrong it's just a different way of viewing so I was often interested when working with other cultures, other nationalities, um, I have to be careful here, that other Westerners, that they always thought they were right. And I used to think, why do you always think you're right? You know, you what? I just didn't understand that. So I suppose that's that was my main... Uh, catalyst for thinking about that the the different lenses the different viewpoints of east and west so amanda can i offer a, a, a commentary and then leanne can bring this home so the challenge when we have binarized thinking is that binaries exist in a hierarchy and that was the point of post-structuralism to just sort of shatter that binary opposition a little bit. So I wonder, Leanne, can I just, obviously, you know, Amanda's going to be reading Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities. We know that. She's going to go on the Edward Sayer journey. We know that. There's going to be all, all this work where she's going to go through all of that. We know that. And that's where she's going to be going. But the, the issue is, Leanne, and this is for you and I to think about to help her, does standpoint theory provide a different way of managing the binary oppositions does it because standpoint theory is structuralist rather than post-structuralist i would argue does that alter our way of thinking through binaries got it no i haven't convinced her haven't convinced her Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's important that. Well, we lost Leanne. We might have lost her. We well, might have lost her. Can I jump in? While we you can, go. Please, go. Go for it, darling. I think that the, the issue or the, what we need to be looking at here is plurality. Yes. Not yes. duality. Boom. So I think that these might be two. Yeah, lenses that you might look but you might they're, they're probably not the only ones and I suppose that's what I was trying to do by looking at that broader framework of epistemic justice that there would be there would be significant number of different lenses and different ways in which um, the curriculum might be viewed developed presented etc so I think you know plurality I would be looking at Somebody has talked in the chat here. There's some really, really interesting stuff in the chat here. There is. Um, around um, what did, sorry, go back a bit. Liam was talking about kind of whiteness and Eurocentricism. So these might be areas that you'd look at rather than just say Western lens. Mm. It's a particular type and they're splintered. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that there might be a more slightly nuanced way of describing the differences and they might be more than just the two. Mm. Yeah, because there's also, I was thinking, um, or have been thinking, in Japan particularly, there's also that um, male-female 
you know the patriarchal society that's yeah. very much in japan subtle but it's yeah. there Mm. Oh, that's right. And Liam's gone straight to third point, uh, third space theory through Barber, which I completely agree with. And, and the only other comment I'd offer as I move to our final sort of question time with colleagues is the big meta question, Amanda, which is whether the very nature of curricular design and curricular development is a colonizing imperative. Whether the mm. very nature of curriculum is colonizing. Oh, I got a nod from Aiden there. So that that's to ponder. Can I now open the question up to, to colleagues? Whoa, well, I've always thought that, to be frank with you, the moment we've got curricular design, backward mapping, assessment protocols, that's that's a colonizing imperative saying one set of knowledges is more important than another, but, th but that's me summoning my inner Illich, Gail. Um, sh should we go to, Shani, do you want to offer a commentary? Or as we've got the two other wonderful supervisors in the party. Shani, do you want to ask, ask a question, noticing the great chat going on as well? Um, I just have a comment really to add. And firstly, thank you, Amanda, and thank you everybody else for your input. Um, I'm just, you know, this is the best <laughs> meeting I've had in such a long time. Um, and I was just looking at um, Beck's comment just now, which is exactly what's going through my head um, in the discussion related to a binary versus the plurality. And it's um, it touches on what Tara mentioned before as well. And it's that idea that the IB is coming in with the IB curriculum and they promote themselves as being applicable to any country in the world, any context in the world. And they pride themselves on drawing from lots of different curricula um, Kind of constructs from many different places but it's still very very much a western european um united states influenced mm. curriculum and the model is that if they hit barriers in countries around the world the the procedure is really to say well let's remove that barrier and let's remove that other barrier and let's remove the next hundred barriers rather than actually thinking why don't we climb over the barrier and have a look from the other side? And that's exactly what Amanda is proposing to do here. And I think what you find is going to be just oh, absolutely mind blowing. Um, so I'm just so intrigued by what you're going to find. And, and look, um, Shana, it's going to be complicated because we've got the binaries and the first stage when you've got the binaries mm -hmm. is to invert the binaries, which yeah, subverts yeah. and defamiliarizes the hierarchy. Then you move into the third space in between and then you subvert the hierarchies, but then you create new binaries and on mm -hmm. we go. Yeah. Um, but Shani, incredibly powerful. We need to talk to Rebecca, who has made all our brains explode at this point. <laughs> so Beck, Beck, did you just do a microphone drop? And you just, you need to demute, Dylan. Did you just do a microphone drop and like, I'm out, mate. I'm out. I'm off to have a Chardonnay. Beck, demute. Demute. What do you mean you're trying to demute? Can I, uh, can I demute you? I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Oh. Um, no, oh, it's 124. It is Chardonnay time. <laughs> Somewhere. Thank Leah, you, Amanda. Leah, Leah, Liam's a couple of vodka and tonics in, but still moving on. Yeah, go on, Beck. Uh, thank you, Amanda. That was that was amazing. That was really good. Um, and I, but Libby created a model, didn't she? The old Libster, she created a model for education. So is that something you would consider? Even if you were in Japan as an Australian teacher or in mm. Japan as a Japanese employee of that mm. system that you use this MYP or IB curriculum mm. it wouldn't matter about the tensions of culture yeah. or the the conflict or the dynamics there it allows for for plural, plurality and the other thing that I love that what Gail talked yeah. about was the Cartesian yeah. divide and certain ways of knowing about things mm. and knowing is to be rational and privileged and to be soulful is less so if we go to soulful or the i'm thinking of the hermeneutics of suspicion and rita felsky we still need to call things out it's good to, to Sorry, my husband's on a phone, phone call and I'm uh, finding, struggling to put my words together you're doing we well we still need to call out with the hermeneutics of suspicion when some things need to be re-privileged 
no, or when when there is theory or criticism that need to be acknowledged right. alongside the soulful, alongside the feeling and the aesthetic. All that's powerful, Amanda. Do yeah, you want to? Sp- it was oh, a bit jumbled. Sorry. No, it was. Ab- I'm I'm moved. No. I'm freaked out. Um, summoning Felsky is incredibly powerful. Amanda, do you want to speak to this and then Aidan and I might have a bit of a scraggy at the end? Go, Amanda. Thanks. Thanks, Vic. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Yeah, I'll take on board all those. It's just given me so much more food for thought and it's interesting you're talking about the Japanese teachers and... um, just their, their, I don't know, their way of thinking. And it was interesting when I worked there, and I, I think I mentioned this in my proposal, that when I was leaving Japan, one of the Japanese teachers came and said to me, I didn't think you would ever leave. I thought you were one of us because I had tried so hard to take on board their culture and be and be respectful of their, their culture. So that was really interesting, and it was quite... I was sort of a bit shocked by that comment. Like so, with Gail or Leanne said for Elisa's um, presentation, you know, in green text at the start of a chapter, could you include your experiences or, a, or, or the start of one lesson and it went differently mm. than you thought or there mm. was some kind of conflict of culture that you highlight because it's those beautiful experiences your experiences that would um really grab in the reader i think lock lock them in lock them into a personal story then you hit them with the theory Ah, (laughs) but so lovely insider outsider autoethnography fantastic stuff and as roland said in the chats go straight to vignette i'm beautiful the ants back so aiden i'll get you to just offer a final commentary as we start to draw proceedings to a close aiden any commentary you'd like to offer about the magnificence that we've seen before christmas um <laughs> i think look I, it it's a really it's very clear to me now um what what you're aiming to do and it's a it's a really ambitious project but i think actually you're already demonstrating the thinking and these conversations are obviously really helping guide your thinking in the right direction so i think you've got you've got the right kind of support you've got the right team around you and i guess it's a matter of um navigating that and continuing to do the great work that you're doing i think the thing for me is going to be and it, it's absolutely the, the end this tail end of this conversation it's that interplay between the ethnographic the autoethnographic your telling of the story your experience bringing people in on the journey with you and then it is it's the hitting them between the eyes with and here's what needs to be done and here's how we change and here are the you know here are the binaries and here's how we break them and here's what we need to do to position the future in a new way and i think you're thinking in that direction you know what needs to happen and I think it's a matter of doing it. So I'm really excited. I think, you know, you sound really excited. It comes across really well. Um, it's great. I'm it, awesome. Yeah. This is just awesome. This is, fa- this is fantastic. So Amanda, it's brilliant. Can I just, as I start to bring the, the threads together for what is a, a formal event, Leanne and Gail, are there any further matters that you would like discharged or addressed with either of the colleagues in their milestones uh, before we start to to end the business, Leanne, any final matters? Um, no, I look. The only thing I really want to say, I guess, to Amanda, because I, I I dropped away. I went away before I had a chance to really uh, talk to her about yeah. things. But I want to talk about maybe a commentary about riskiness and courage, because mm-hmm. I think, and this also connects to endpoint theory. Your question, Tara, this idea of sometimes we use and you know your experience is incredibly important and the, or what everybody's saying what rebecca is saying about threading that through and having that be a dr- real driver of your research is, is incredibly important but i think it's also important to not let yourself stay safe behind that narrative i think mm. it's important for you to allow the risk to complicate where you're coming from and what you're trying to do it's very easy to sit back sometimes I think and go oh this is my experience this is how it worked for me this is Mm. what I saw never having to trouble that never having to you know and and part of viewing other people will is is part of you doing that 
but I think it's very important, even from a standpoint, is to not settle in that standpoint, not to mm. settle in that experience, mm. but to allow it to transform and to be something else. And that is what true interdisciplinary knowledge is actually mm. about. It's about allowing riskiness, allowing connections to be made that were not made before. Mm. And I think I, I always get a little bit agitated or uh, you know, about autoethnography in particular because I think it's so important. It allows disempowered narratives, visibility, and 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 to be present within you know different ways of thinking. But it also can be very safe. It can be very oh, this is my experience mm. and my truth, um, overarching mm. you know the narrative that you're presenting. So I mm. think this is incredibly important in your work. So congratulations on it. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask a question to that, Leanne? That's interesting. Sure. So the um, two points, so that because I've worked with the Japanese, I'm very aware of and very careful not to offend and to be respectful. Um, the other point that I wanted to make was that you were talking about um and i understand this so it's me um telling my my story or or what what you know certain situations for me could you add in the work if you're recounting a situation and could i recount the the lens or the view from another person in the same situation could you so like you've got, yeah, you've got a to be different super careful. Yeah, you got it. That's one of the problems with autoethnography from that if you're talking about other people and they haven't given consent for you to talk about them, mm. it's problematic. So you've got to be super careful about how you do that. Mm. Um, so it really does have to be your experience. As soon as you start talking about other people, you have an ethics an ethics yeah. problem. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. but what I also wanted to maybe question you on a little bit and provoke you a little bit more is this idea, what is offensive how does offensiveness work in this situation and how does offensiveness impact upon the building of a new curriculum mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah look can i say um, amanda leanne's just given you your conclusion can i say and maybe yes. maybe the introduction as well because it is about bravery and it is about really critiquing yourself and your life and and the story that we tell ourselves about who we are as teachers. That's what yeah. Leanne's just given you. Yeah. I'm just writing this down. <laughs> Look, I'm recording it, eh? Wow. I know, but I, yeah. yeah. So what, what is offensiveness in curriculum or in the situation? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I suppose I wouldn't, so for example, I wouldn't, um, I could say that um, I think sometimes the male teachers think that they know more than the female teachers. Uh, so I, I, I could say that, but I would not want to offend. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's but, but then but you contextualize the self. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no, we've we known each other in a previous right. life, Leanne. Yeah. <laughs> So and you contextualise yourself. And go, oh, I think I've just been offended. Mm, it's called the patriarchy. Um, misogyny does that on a daily basis. You know, it's like, wow, there's injustice. Mm, it's called capitalism. So that's the thing about autoethnography. If the methodology can, can be configured in the epistemology of injustice, epistemological injustice, then then some some fire happens. I think, Amanda. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I know. I know there will be could be fire. <laughs> Fire, fire walk with me or courage indeed as leanne said this oh, is what brilliant um and can i say the uh, role and you're a legend there's a whole role and narrative happening here this is just brilliant um can i go to gail though noting our assessors and noting the time now gail are there any final matters that you would wish to raise or discuss yeah very very briefly please save the chat as well as the video this is amazing <laughs> yeah I'm, <insights>. I'm... <laughs> yeah so they'll be saved don't worry about trying to write them down as we're talking got it all um the only other thing, very, very quickly, and, and you're very welcome to throw this out, but if you're talking about um, interdisciplinarity, 
and you're talking about multidisciplinarity, you're talking about deprivileging the privileges of certain disciplines as ways, as well as epistemologies, you might then think about how the form of your thesis is presented. And what I mean by that is that um, I had a beautiful academic, um, I had a beautiful lecture when I was doing my undergrad that always talked about um, new bottles for new wine. If you have something new to say, you, knew it, you need a new form through which to communicate it because the form will curtail, will prevent the newness, you know? If it's, if it's standard, it's got a standard way of being presented, we're used to it, it's safe. So if you're really thinking about interdisciplinarity, thinking about how would other disciplines communicate and present some of this. Somebody's already, I think it was Liam already mentioned visuals. Somebody else talked about vignettes. You know, somebody's talking, Leanne's talking about risk. Could the risk also transcend to the form through which or the forms through which you communicate? Are you privileging one language? Are you priv privileging English mm. over Japanese? Should certain sections be written in another language or in another form? Mm. Would that, again, reinforce the, the ideas? I'm so sorry, that's my phone. I said I'd be fine by one, so somebody's very <laughs> popular. <laughs> like popular. One, so I'm going to mute now to take that, but I'm just going to leave you with that idea that a form yeah. might also be something that you consider. Gail, that's yeah. brilliant. That's Thank brilliant. You. Thank you. So, Amanda, of course, that's the Bauhaus form follows content. So how could form transform? Because in many ways you're dealing with curriculum. Mm. So how can pedagogy, andragogy, multimodality mm. shake up and shatter IB curricula? Mm. Mm. I like I like visuals because I'm a visual arts teacher. So um, I'm, I'm all up for that. Oh, hello. All oh, this is going to be exciting, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> look, look, colleagues, I'm conscious of time. So, firstly, I need to thank enormously our assessors, Leanne and Gail. And, look, I will say this overtly they're remarkable scholars. They've given their time and their expertise, and they've read everything, and they've given that time for free. And in Leanne and Gail's case, they've given it for free for our Alyssa for three years. So, I am so grateful yes. that you embody. Oh, we're doing this how we did. We're so California. <laughs> An old goth can't do this stuff, Amanda. Don't do it to me, mate. Don't do it to me. But Leanne and Gail, you embody the best of what uh, a generous scholar does. I'm so grateful to you. And I hope in different forms, Flinders University can repair that debt to you both. And just, I thank you so much for that. To Amanda and Alyssa. What a wonderful, wonderful hour and a half we've shared. Uh, I've learned so much. I'm provoked. Uh, it's just been remarkable. Again, we've seen how scholarship has developed, and I'm just so proud of the pair of you and the relationship and the friendship that you've both created too in the short and medium term. Uh, to Shani and Aidan, my co-supervisors, uh, there could not be a better dream team. You are both absolutely amazing. And to all our friends around the world who have joined us, Liam, it's now about 2.33 a.m. in the morning, Liam. Uh, in the northwest of England. Good luck with your thesis that I think is being submitted in a couple of weeks, brother. We we wish you well. And to all our friends who have joined us around the world, we thank you for your expertise. And so all that happens at this junction now is Leanne and Gail have a think. They write down some views and some comments and the milestone will be completed. Colleagues, we wish you well. Happy Christmas, happy festivity, whatever you celebrate. Big shout out to all the Satanists out there, pagan out. Rock and roll. Hold on. <laughs> Out. Um, love you all. Take care, team. You are magnificent. Thank you for your time. Bye. Love Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.